Thank you for participating in the Humane Summit, a virtual speaker series brought to you by the Humane Education Coalition. This session is sponsored by the Griffin Press and the Humane Society of the United States. We are grateful for your attendance today for On Dean Sherman's speaker session, Voiceless New Animal Protection Education Online Resources. On Dean is the co-founder and managing director of Voiceless, the Animal Protection Institute in Australia. She is the author of the young adult fiction, Sky, and memoir, The Miracle of Love. Andine holds a BA in Communications from the University of Technology, Sydney, and an MA in Environmental Education from Macquarie University. At this time, I will pass things over to our speaker, Andine Sherman. Hi, I'm Andine Sherman, and I'm the co-founder and managing director of Voiceless, the Animal Protection Institute. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our organization and why we're so passionate about protecting animals in the space of humane education and about all our new programs, Animal Protection Education, which we call APES. So I had the great fortune of starting my organization, Voiceless, together with my father, Brian Sherman, um, back almost 15 years ago, or actually 15 years ago in 2004. Um, we chose animals to focus on. Uh, animals are sentient beings just like us. They have intelligence, emotions, um, the capacity to feel pain and pleasure, strong family bonds and uh, uh, groups and very rich experiences of the world. When we discovered um, how animals are tr treated today in our society, um, in Australia and around the world, we knew that we had to do something to make a difference. We researched the lives of animals who are exploited for food, for fashion and entertainment and subjected to lives of terrible suffering. We discovered that their bodies are mutilated without pain relief, they're confined in cages or stalls with no access to the earth, the fresh air, um, the outside world. They're routinely separated from their babies at birth and deprived of their most basic natural behaviors like foraging for food, building a nest, or even feeding their young. They show signs of serious stress, pain, depression, and more. Animals are not voiceless, however, we just refuse to hear them. And sadly, our legal systems, systems and government bodies um, entrench their voicelessness and do little to protect them. When we researched laws and legislations, we had discovered that animals are exempt, or farm animals are exempt from even the most basic animal welfare laws. So despite dogs and pigs having the same capacity for pain and suffering and equal intelligence, although pigs are known to be smarter than dogs, um, and that intelligence isn't really a marker for our ethical obligations anyway, uh, we are able to treat a pig um, with a level of cruelty that if we did the same to our dog, we would find ourselves jailed or fined for animal abuse. So animal suffering was and still is the driving force for my father and I to strive to make a difference and protect some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Over the past 15 years, uh, Voiceless has helped to transform Australia's fledging animal protection movement into a powerful force for change. I'll just spend a minute telling you about, about some of the things that we've done over the last uh, 15 years. Um, here you can see a selection of some of our reports um, into animal industries and some toolkits for animal law. Um, we've also done um, some cutting edge consumer campaigns. This is an image from our uh, national adver advertising campaign that was in magazines and bus stops and on buses around Australia. For many, many years, we also uh, ran a small grants program where we supported other animal advocates and projects around Australia um, to capacity build organizations and advocates to become a force for change. We created uh, media prizes uh, for print, audio, and television. 
and one of our biggest focuses was legal education and advocacy. This is a snapshot from our law lecture series, which we did every year, and we brought out leading lawyers and change makers from around the world. Um, and we've you know, had tens of thousands of people participating and a lot of media interest. We also built a high um, a network of uh, influ influential people, high profile leaders in business, arts, media, law and science to lend their voices to the cause. And this is our um, very dear patron, uh, John Kutsia, who's a Nobel winning uh, writer. Um, and this has really helped to bring the key issues about animal cruelty and animal protection from the fringes of society into mainstream uh, life. This is um, our other patron, Michael Kobe, who was a former high court judge and highly respected uh, in Australia. This is Charlie Teo, also a very well respected and um, celebrated neurosurgeon and our patron. So today, animal protection is seen as one of the biggest social justice movements of our century. And today, we are focusing all our work on education, um, schools and universities. Um, and we kicked off two very exciting programs um, in 2017. And today, I'll talk to you about our high school education program. Why did we start focusing on school education? Well, we know that youth are the next generation of influencers and voters. They're going to be our future lawyers, our future politicians, CEOs, and judges. So um, our animal protection education, which we call APE, our APE resources are for high school students and among really the first of their kind um, in Australia and around the world. They are the go-to resource for teachers who are looking for professional, mainstream, educational animal protection content. They address concepts and philosophies in animal rights and law and promote critical thinking um, about the human-animal relationship. And they feature international change makers, scientists, writers, philosophers, and intellectuals who are thinking outside the box, box and can challenge students. We are focusing on high school students because we believe that this is an age where students can think critically, they can read more challenging information, they can hear different viewpoints and analyze, debate and discuss them amongst themselves. Uh, the parents are less involved in their learning, so that reduces potential obstacles as well. Um, each of our APE contains a plethora of different resources and they address broad concepts in animal protection. Um, they span single issues such as dolphins in captivity, which was one of our first APEs, um, to large industries like factory farming or industrialized farming, um, to emerging concepts like legal personhood for animals, which is a, a, a big movement in the USA at the moment. Um, they are, you know, targeted at teachers themselves, so teachers can use them and have them available online. And we want to give teachers everything that they need so they can deliver a class themselves on this subject. And we've chosen this um, technique because we believe that this will reach more students um, rather than us going in person and traveling around Australia and presenting ourselves if we um, if we teach the teachers and enable them to uh, deliver the content, then we can have a much greater impact. Um, as the saying goes, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Although we'd be choosing tofu in this case. <laughs> uh, we're making everything free uh, for teachers because this is our, you know, this is part of a movement and our aims are to create a kinder world uh, for animals and we want to reduce any obstacles, such as financial obstacles. Um, and we want this information to be available and accessible as widely as possible. It's also important that our apes are um, created by educators for educators. And so we've been working um, collaboratively with teacher consultants, um, teachers who specialize in different subject areas, 
to make um, as sure as possible that our apes are really hitting the target and giving teachers exactly what they need. By encouraging students to think critically about systems of institutionalized cruelty that animals are subjected to, we do hope to create a future society that is more compassionate and one that ultimately rejects the unethical systems that cause, cause untold suffering to animals. We believe the way that our society treats animals in the future will come from the fundamental beliefs that have been taught at school to young people. And even though animal protection, as I said, is one of the greatest social justice movements of our time, there is a serious lack of education on a school level on this subject. However, students are receiving materials from farm animal industries that are targeting teachers and targeting schools. And these materials are influencing them and promoting values um, such as that animals are not sentient and that their lives aren't important and that they are our property to do what we will and that we should trust farmers and government and lawmakers to take care of them. And these beliefs are sadly misguided. So what is in our apes? Well, firstly, um, we, we are creating videos. These are short explanatory videos that can be shown in the classroom that's suitable for that age group. Um, and we, we've been using a mixture of animation, interviews, footage, stop motion, and we're continuing to try new ways to be engaging and creative. So I'll now show you one of our videos on legal personhood. In most countries, animals are considered human property under the law. Property is a complex concept but it can be understood as a thing owned by a person. This means that a dog is a thing, just like a mobile phone or a truck. But you have to treat living animal things differently from non-living things. For example, if you have a pet dog, you have to feed them, walk them, and take them to the vet. This is because we have animal welfare laws that aim to protect animals from cruelty. But this still means that animals have owners, and it's the owner's responsibility to take care of their animals. This does not mean that animals have legal rights. Rights are a special way of protecting important interests under the law. Should we change the legal status of animals so that they can have rights? Humans have a lot of rights. For example, children have the right not to be separated from their parents unless it's in their best interests. Animals do not have this right. Humans also have the right to be represented in court and to challenge somebody holding them against their will. And if the human cannot do so, they have the right to have someone else do it on their behalf. In court, the humans imprisoning them have to justify their detention. If the detention is found to be unjustified, the imprisoned human can be set free. Animals have not yet been recognised as having this fundamental right to freedom. However, some lawyers in the USA are arguing that animals should have legal personhood so their interests can be represented in a court of law. To do this, the US lawyers have to convince the court that animals can be legal persons as legal persons are entitled to rights. This may sound confusing at first if you think that a legal person always has to be a human being. But rivers, corporations and ships can also be legal persons. So, should the status of animals be changed from thing to legal person as well? The lawyers from the Non-Human Rights Project argue that they should. They say at least some animals, like chimpanzees and elephants, qualify for legal personhood. One of their clients is a chimpanzee called Tommy. He lives in a small concrete cage in a caravan park. The lawyers argue his detention is unjustified and that he should be released to a sanctuary. 
They argue that all chimpanzees like Tommy have certain capacities that they share with human beings. They argue that these shared capacities should entitle them to legal personhood. One of these capacities is self-awareness. Tommy is conscious of his own individuality and separateness from the environment and other individuals. Adult chimps can even recognise photographs of themselves from their youth. The other capacity is autonomy. Tommy can desire something and intentionally choose how to live his life. He doesn't act purely out of instinct. Chimps have a language and culture and can plan for the future, just like many humans. The lawyers argue that because animals like Tommy have these capacities, they also have rights that protect these capacities, like the right to bodily liberty to protect their autonomy. If these rights were recognised, lawyers could act on behalf of Tommy or other chimpanzees if they were being held captive, just like a lawyer could act on behalf of a human being. So far, some US judges haven't fully accepted the argument. They have said that animals are unable to bear responsibilities and duties, and to be a legal person and have rights, you must be able to take on such duties and obligations. The lawyers at the Non-Human Rights Project disagree and point out that personhood has already been granted to non-human entities like rivers and forests, as well as a chimpanzee in Argentina. They also point out that many humans who can't exercise duties are still capable of holding rights, such as human babies. They argue that one reason we don't grant legal personhood to animals is because we believe humans are superior to other animals. This worldview allows us to treat animals, like Tommy, in ways that we would not allow a human to be treated, even though we have exactly the same relevant capacities like self-awareness and autonomy. One of the judges who heard the Non-Human Rights Project's lawyers' arguments said that chimpanzees are definitely not just things. If chimpanzees and other animals are not things, then what are they? What do you think? Should Tommy and animals like him be granted legal personhood? Or is it okay for animals to be things and remain as human property? Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. Okay. These are our infographics. This is a visual way to lay out the information that we're presenting to students. They're printable for teachers and for those students who are more visual learners, they're very important. We're also creating fact sheets, which are in-depth, you know, um, booklets of information, also all available online that go much more in-depth into the issues that we're talking about and also have all the scientific and legal references. Um, we have classroom activities and teacher notes. So we're aiming here in Australia to link to the Australian curriculum as much as we can. And we're covering subjects such as history, English, geography, science. And so that means a whole large range of teachers um, can use our materials and make it relevant to their subject areas. We're also doing a podcast series. So po podcasts are becoming increasingly popular in the classroom and teach, uh, teachers can either assign podcast listening as homework or the students can listen while they're in, their, in the classroom. And in the podcast, we're interviewing various experts on the issue that we're covering. So getting lots of different perspectives um, because our main you know, focus is on critical thinking and asking the students to think for themselves what but um, to analyze and debate this information. So for example, in our um, podcast on dolphins in captivity, we interviewed a surfer and advocate for dolphins, a professor of marine ecology at a top university, um, a dolphin protection advocate um, with an international campaign, a photojournalist, and an advocacy director at a non-government organization. We're also creating worksheets, quizzes, and other class tools such as PowerPoint presentations, just to give teachers 
everything they could possibly want in the classroom. We've also set up an education advisory council to ensure that we're creating the most professional materials that we can do. And we're delighted that um, Megan is, has joined us on our council. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we've created several other groups. Um, firstly, we've interviewed a group of teachers and tested our materials out with them and had a lot of great feedback um, that has helped us um, refine our techniques. Um, we've also uh, gotten feedback from students directly. Um, and we have a more informal um, teacher advisory group where we can ask teachers in different subject matters what they think about um, our approach to different issues. We've learned that we have to put a lot of effort into growing our own database of interested teachers um, because this is a new area for us and this has been a little bit challenging. Um, so I'll tell you how we've been going about it um, in the hope that it will help you as well. Um, we've been really as active as possible reaching out to this new market. So we've, for, for example, um, purchased databases of you know, schools with, um, with email lists. We've done a lot of social media targeting on uh, Facebook. Um, we've also been going to conferences and exhibiting and speaking at conferences and talking to events that teachers attend. Uh, we're also sharing our materials and making them freely available to other educational sites. There's some very large um, websites that offer you know, a multitude of different resources to teachers. And so they've taken on our materials and are offering it to their teachers as well. So our aim is just to get our materials out there and not kind of hold on to, to them too tight um, through our website. Um, and all in all, we are, we're finding that our community is growing over the last year um, and we're part a lot or as much as we can with other organizations. For example, for our Dolphin Ape, we partner, partnered with Action for Dolphins, which is an NGO here in Australia. Um, also for our legal personhood video um, that you just saw, we partnered with the um, uh, Non-Human Rights Project in the USA. Um, and we're also partnering with um, our patron, John Kutsia, and making his book, The Lives of Animals, um, a fictional a novel available for students and basing materials around that. Um, and we're looking for more partners. So if anybody out there is interested, we would really love to hear from you. If you're an N NGO or have any um, causes um, connected to animal protection that you feel um, should be prioritized. So what are our next steps? We're going to continue to build rich, deep content through our apes. And we have many future subjects that we're working on uh, this year. For example, factory farming or industrialized uh, farming. farming is a very big focus. It has always been at Voiceless and for my father, Brian and I. And this is because of the sheer scale of the suffering with you know, about 70 billion animals around the world um, that are killed every year for human consumption. So this is you know, obviously a very big issue. Um, another issue that's not so well known about is, is fish and the sentience of fish. And so this is an area that um, we want to explore in one of our apes. The kangaroo industry is um, the biggest wildlife slaughter in the world. And that's obviously very important, not only to Australia, but also to all the international markets that import kangaroo products. Um, so that's another area we'll be focusing on um, soon. And finally, um, the area of clean meat or lab-grown meat and animal products. That's a very exciting, fascinating area of food technology that has the potential to almost eliminate the production of animals. Um, and this is when animal products are actually grown um, in laboratories using cells um, and can look and taste uh, and feel like real meat. <laughs> Um, our big aim is also to make these apes relevant for teachers all over the world um, and align our materials with other curriculums in other countries. And we're thinking possibly of the International Baccalaureate. Um, and we would also love feedback from international educators about what you might need um, from us in order for you to make these materials available in your countries. 
So thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm hoping that we will soon have a more humane and kinder world. And uh, feel free to message me or get in touch with me anytime. Thank you. This concludes our speaker session. Thank you so much for joining us. You can learn more here or by clicking the resource links in the summit. We hope you've enjoyed this speaker session and that you'll join us for another one soon. Please consider making a donation to the Humane Education Coalition to help us continue providing programs and events like the Humane Summit. We rely on your support to help create a more compassionate, just, and sustainable future through education. Visit hecoalition.org give to contribute today. Thanks again.